Welcome to the MMA Road Show, episode number 402. My name is John Morgan. Cold coffee is with me, but we're not stopping there. It's like old home week here. It's the reunion. Nolan King is in town and joining us. The old Baron of Bellator himself. <laughs> well, good to see you, man. What's going on, brother? Uh, nothing much. I didn't know if it was disrespectful coming in here with a hot coffee and the Casa de Cold Coffee, but I've yeah, heard but so much about it. The people here were wonderful. They let me in anyway. They told me well. that this was a one-time exception, that they <laughs> That's it. preferred very, that I don't do this again, but they're, very strict. they're let it slide. So. Very strict. I should say, by the way, while you did roll in with some hot coffee, we sw- swiftly... Switched to some frosty beverages and even cold co- we we got cold coffee out of retirement for this special occasion and he's got an award winning Paps Blue Ribbon in hand America enjoying it we're back I love it well for a little bit I love it <laughs> so interesting enough Nolan you're in town for a day basically you flew into Las Vegas of course uh, USC 282 is this week you're not sticking around though um, but you're heading back to Phoenix tonight even so I mean that. You're jet-setting, bro. Jet-setting for a media day, just coming in and uh, you know flying out the same day. Yeah, the thing that stinks is like me showing up today being really tired. I had nobody to complain to because all you guys are so used to feeling so you know drained and everything. But, yeah, I flew in, got up at 345 local time in Arizona with the one-hour difference, flew in here, hit media day, going to do this podcast, hit some ramen that Kenny's yeah. been hyping for weeks yeah. and weeks, and uh, then I'll head back to Phoenix Stay there. I got a little uh, trip planned with the boys in Scottsdale this weekend. See the Patriots play Monday Night Football, and I'll be back on the East Coast. That's like, big time, that, man. That's big I love time. it. Yeah. I love it. And, and 3 a.m. flights, that's no joke, man. That's that's hard shit. Yeah. Like, because you have that stress. Like, I, whenever I have a flight that early, I always – I don't sleep. sleep. Yeah, I, I can't sleep well because you're just literally, am I going to wake up? Am I going to wake up? Are you the kind that sets a bunch of alarms, or did you just set one alarm and just trust that you would get up? Um, So I, I definitely set a lot of alarms, but I think – when I know I have something that's coming up in the morning, like my adrenaline will, the first alarm goes off and I panic that I had slept through it. That you it. slept through something? You know what I mean? Like, oh no, hopefully that wasn't my third alarm. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's my first one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it wasn't that bad. Once I once I got some food in me, I think too, like my body was kind of thrown off traveling. Yeah. You know, I got, when we got to the PI, I had a bagel and I, my, uh, my energy kicked in and yeah. it was good, so. Now, the bagel, of course, was consumed. Uh, was that during the Power Slap League uh, media day? Was yes, because I did not have a bagel because I did not attend the Power Slap League. You didn't go over. That's day. where the bagels were yes. located, sir. They were, you had to go over That's to how the they power baited slap. everybody. I was like, everybody's like, I was like, man, there's no breakfast. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's bagels. I said, no, there's not. And they said, oh, it's over at the Power Slap. I was like, I see what they did. That's funny. Well, we'll get to the Power Slap <laughs> in a second, but I did want to ask you about uh, because you did a little bit of work, right? I mean, yeah. well, you, you saw you said a, a vacation out in Phoenix, but you did a little bit of work as well. Uh, checking out Cain Velasquez uh, doing the wrestling gig. I guess um, first, just h- how was the wrestling gig? How did he do? Obviously, I mean, uh, I don't want to say like I bet he's rusty. I mean, that's kind of bad for a guy that's been yeah. locked up. You know what I mean? But uh, I don't know what was the, what was the energy. Then it sounds like he really interacted with the crowd a yeah. lot. Yeah, yeah, it was it was interesting, man. You know, I think uh, I I watched pro wrestling when I was younger. You know, WWE. I went to a few house shows. I had gone to SummerSlam. Came to the TD Garden when I was younger, but. So I have a basic knowledge of wrestling, but I feel like Lucha Libre was kind of a whole different thing, um, especially considering most of the presentation is in Spanish. You know, there were a few English, uh, evil English uh, speaking factions, you know, America, guys waving American flags. So it was interesting to see the flip side of That's like, funny. you know, like we're the bad guys. Yeah, exactly. One, one guy came out to, um, you know, uh, just a, an image that his name's Sam Adonis. I've actually talked to him a little bit since this. He's kind of an up and coming guy, but he came out to a video that was playing on loop of. Uh, Mexico losing in the World Cup, you know, so all the people there booing and there's like laughing emojis going over the screen of this goal being scored over and over again, you know, so it was it was fun, though. Yeah, big time. That was a that was a good play. Went a little viral, too. So I think he had to have been uh, pretty happy with it. But the experience was interesting. You know, I didn't really know what to expect. And I think uh, my knowledge of covering pro sports has largely been the UFC and Bellator. So, you know, both of those organizations seem to have PR figured out pretty well. So to go to something where it's maybe a little bit smaller of an organization right. where they don't deal with a lot of English speak media, there were some times where I was, you know, kind of had to carve out some content for myself, so to speak, and right. try to get what I wanted and go out of my way. You know, things weren't necessarily handed. But um, as far as the performance goes, you know, he came out, he spoke to the crowd off the bat. So that was good, um, you know, to kind of get some quotes from him. Um, I've been working trying to get some access to him. It seemed like uh, the promotion was fine with it. They had no issues. Um, I think his agent was kind of just politely 
decline to uh, to have that happen. I, I get well, it's it. It's still probably not a good time to be commenting publicly. Yeah, right? yeah, totally. You know, and it's one of those things too. Like even you know, I wasn't there to cross and cross examine him or ask him really any details about the case. Like my main angle was just like, how are you feeling? You know what I mean? How did that feel? How did that feel after everything you went through? But I think you know, again, somebody that maybe. We know Kane's kind of quiet. Maybe he's more reserved. Um, you know, even in the the video that came out of him being talked to when he came out of jail, he's just kind of uncomfortable with yeah. the whole thing. So I get it. You know, better be safe than sorry. But you know, I did see him perform. Um, he seemed a little bit maybe uh, understandably had put on a little bit of weight, like he was wearing a shirt when he was wrestling. Which I mean, who can blame the guy, right? But I will say his athleticism was still there. And for you know a guy who I still get a little nervous sometimes seeing that knee brace and some yeah. of the stuff that happened in MMA. He was doing as much athletic stuff that I had seen on tape when I went back and watched his old wrestling clips. He did all those those really high profile moves, and he even jumped off the top rope a couple times, dove out of the crowd at one point into the you know uh, uh, ringside at one point. So he was moving good. He seemed to have a lot of fun in there. His family was cage side, uh, ringside, which was obviously like a, a probably a pretty powerful thing for him. Um, and then, yeah, I saw, you know, I was able to be backstage at the end after the event ended and, and to see him back there with his family kind of in a, a normal, it seemed normal, you yeah. know what I mean? And I think that's not something we were able to really say about him since February. <sighs> oh, that's crazy, man. So he had to get special permission, right, to do this one off. So do you know, is his, does he want to continue to do this? And is he going to have to go and seek permission for every single time he wants to do yeah, something? Yeah, so I think he will have to get permission. Um, I don't know if there's maybe some sort of umbrella permission they can grant him. You know, you get to we understand that you do this, you're signing up for six events and we can just approve them all at once. Right. You know? But it seemed to me the vibe and just kind of some of the rumblings backstage, some of the other wrestlers were kind of like, oh, can't wait to do this again. You know, so, you know, maybe there's not anything hard planned, but it seems like everybody's optimistic. And uh, yeah, he did, he did get granted special permission. It seemed like there was um, some sort of, uh, I don't know if you want to call him a police officer, but some sort of officer that was with him. Um, that was part of his agreement was, in order to get his GPS monitoring system off, he had to have an officer with him at all times. Right. So it was an older gentleman. I'm assuming maybe he was uh, – or the person I presume to be that was an older gentleman in the party that seemed to be kind of standing off to the side and maybe a retired police officer. Right. So that's speculation, but um, there was somebody that was with somebody him that had, to, visually had to accompany us. him throughout the, the trip is my understanding. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So listen, I mean, I know, like you said, you've covered this thing extensively. Um, and I guess, you know, at heart, none of us are legal experts, right? But when you – spend this much time around it you've, you've gotten familiar with the case at least I mean realistically what are we looking at here right because I mean it's I mean obviously you don't have to rehash all the details but it's just one of those weird things where like we all understand what he did here yet at the same time you can't be driving down the you know road shooting guns out of moving vehicles right because you're endangering the public so it's it's obviously been this thing where I think there's been this moral tear the whole time like I don't even know what I think is right you know I, I, I do think it's right that he's out of jail now I thought that was a little bit ridiculous that he was in jail that long I mean I think we all knew that he wasn't really a danger to society he was a danger to one man right I mean that was always clear but I mean do you have an understanding yet of what the ultimate resolution of this is leaning towards yeah it's, it's tough to say I mean that was a big surprise because I thought things were going you know just there was no progress from February until November 8th when he got bail and so to hear that to you know to, to kind of hear the judge during the November 8th hearing who was a new judge who had not been you know the one to deny this bail over and over again previously to kind of hear and Kenny was actually with me listening during this um, kind of and I think we at the time we were like man did he just kind of make it sound like he was going to give him what he wants right. you know, and he took a recess came back, sure enough, granted him bail. So that was a, a step in the right direction, but it also kind of threw off my – any. and again, I'm not a legal expert, but my compass in this whole thing was like, man, he's he's got an uphill battle. But then to hear a judge say, you know, essentially reinforce a lot of the things he's, his side had been saying the whole time makes me think like – you know, maybe this whole morality versus legality thing, there isn't this really hard line. Maybe there is some sort of understanding that the court has and the guy, you know, the judge kind of qualified this idea of heat of uh, passion. You know, this idea that somebody that was a reasonable person was faced with unreasonable circumstances and acted, didn't know how to act to them, essentially. Right. Act, you know, react to them. So if that's the case in which is, he's got a great lawyer who's like I said, he's like the far scump of lawyers. He's been like the lawyer for Michael Jackson, you know, Suge Knight. Uh, if you just go down the list, Jesse Smollett, Colin Kaepernick, like all these major things. Mark Garagas, he's a CNN, Fox News contributor. He's done a ton of different things. Like he's somebody that's been in this position quite a bit. And talking to him last week in an interview, he made that he kind of broke it down where he made it sound 
very and again he's a lawyer so, and I'm not but right. he he made it sound not the craziest thing that that Kane could you know potentially get off on the fact that was this premeditated you know did he plan it is that something that can be proved and then also this heat of passion clause which can ultimately uh, my understanding is it can either lessen the charges or it can acquit him yeah it's wild because I mean again again qualifying it over and over not a legal expert don't know what all the statutes are and all that but just from a reasonable person man I love just understanding the situation like it just seems like Time served, probation, yes, you know, maybe can't own firearms, like totally fine. Like all the things like reasonable, I, I, I think would, would be understandable, you know what I mean? I, I just, I, I don't know, man. I hope it works out that yeah. way. One thing I didn't understand with the new judge, was that something that they requested to be overseen by a new judge or was that just like scheduling is how it worked so out? The way that it worked was my understanding is there's different judges that do different parts of the legal process. So when a, like when somebody's arrested at first, when they do their initial arraignment, there's a certain judge, a certain department, they call it. So it's a certain courtroom. And usually the courtroom either has one or two judges in, like, in that department. So my understanding is, um, you know, throughout this process, there's different judges for each step. But the thing is, during each of these hearings, Velasquez's side can file a motion in the middle of a hearing that's not even related about whatever the motion's for. So in this, this case, they were essentially looking at the charges. This judge was doing something called a pretrial hearing, and he was looking at these um, these charges and making sure that there was, um, you know, enough cause for the, D, you know, whatever the, the whatever the DA was charging him with, was there enough evidence for this to go to trial? To be, pro to be, you know, for the charges to be pressed, all this stuff. So that was the step that was being taken. Now, in the middle of that or towards the end, Mark Garrigus put two motions forward. One of them, I believe, was to dismiss one of the charges completely, and the other one was to ask for bail again. And so he had done that at a number of different stages of the hearings, but this one happened to have a judge that was not the same judge that oversaw the first part of the, the procedure. Right. So it was kind of a technicality. It was probably a s smart chess move. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, and it obviously was because it paid off. That's awesome, man. Well, at least he's out. I said, I mean, again, and it, I said it from the beginning. Like, don't want to just be like, well, it's Kane, man. The guy shot somebody. What are you going to do? You know, I'd, it's it's illegal, right? I mean, again, and I think the fact that it was in, uh, you know, an expressway or whatever, and, and that just makes it even worse, right? Because now you're exposing it to, to, to random people potentially getting hurt. But I, for one – I'm awfully glad that, that he's out of jail. Any idea uh, how much time we're looking at at resolution? Or so like I asked Mark Garrigus this, and you know he made it sound like basically Kane has a, a date on December 28th is the next one. He'll declare who his lawyers are going to be to represent him in in trial. Um, I'm assuming he'll stick with the same legal team, but you never know. And then Mark Garrigus kind of said that California right now, because since the pandemic has been backed, backed up, up, so like a hospital, essentially they triage the cases. So they say – all right, this one's more serious or this one, you know, this person's, it's more of an urgent matter. Interesting. So that can have some, uh, you know, obviously will, will be part of the decision-making process of, of when this happens. How, whatever the judge looks at this and says, thinks about how serious it is or how pressing it is or, you know, if Kane, the fact that he's out now on house arrest, does that make it less severe than somebody that's incarcerated? That's, that's what I'm wondering. I'm not, is is I'm it more sure. severe or I'm less sure. severe, right? Yeah, you know so, what I mean? Like, I don't know which way they'll go. So it could be delayed. He made it sound like it would be. And, you know, there's a bunch of – there could be delays anyway. You know, both sides have to say, okay, we're ready to go to trial. So that's the first thing. Then the triage. And then we'll finally see it. So, well, great, great to see he's at least back with his family, man. And uh, we'll hope for the best resolution for him. So, all right, this week, like I said, uh, USC 282 is in town in Las Vegas. Nolan, of course, uh, will not be here for the fight itself, but of course was here for the media day. And we'll get into all that in a second. But I must say, Power Slap League Media Day did happen. Uh, I don't think any of us knew about it till kind of late in it. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I just kind of want to get your guys' take on. I mean, I spoke to everybody there. I don't know who I was speaking to, you know what I mean? But really just tried to get their, their temperature. And I asked a lot of the safety questions, you know, why. Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you. And, and again, and I've already had some people, I, you know, I, I took a picture of the belt and I had people chastising me on social media and just saying, I can't believe you're going to cover this nonsense. And I'm not going to cover it at the same extent of like, this is a, 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 a in-depth sport like mixed martial I mean, it's, it's not. It, but I don't know, the outrage – I don't want to say – do you feel that outrage or are you surprised by the – I don't know. I, I've just been surprised at the amount of pushback on this. And I can't help but think a lot of it is just because Dana White is involved and anything Dana White's going to be involved in, people are going to want to shit on, if I'm being honest. Um, but I don't know. It just seems weird. Among a community of fans that is like, did you see that highlight reel head kick knockout? How dope was that? 
to then be like, there is no way I'm going to watch a man slap another man. I, I don't know. It's weird. So where does where does your moral bearing stand on this? Yeah, you know, it's, there's a, I think there's obviously a, new, numerous layers to this, and I think for me, you know, the first time I ever saw this before the UFC got involved or, uh, you know, we ever thought that the, the Dana White or anybody would be associated with this was obviously like the viral – clips out of Russia and at the time I remember you know thinking okay this is kind of stupid like I don't know you know how you could <laughs> watch it stupid. watch a whole event of this or whatever um, you know but again I guess I watched it you know and when it would go by my feet I would watch it so I mean there is some value in that I guess for me I think you have to draw a line somewhere when it comes to combat sports right like there has to be some line and just for me I think that in my moral compass this crosses it a little bit I think just the fact that there's no defense and I know Dane is calling them defenders and he said that there's some sort of techniques but that's just the one thing where I'm like I just I don't I think that's where it separates it for me mentally and, you know I'm not gonna I don't hate on these guys for doing it I don't necessarily I think you know if anybody's gonna start there is there is a moral obligation I think to a certain degree to make sure companies don't have athletes get significant brain damage I right. think the commission though that should be if anybody's mad I think a lot of it should fall on the commission because um, even listening to the meetings recently, it kind of almost sounded to me a little bit like the basis of it being approved was on the fact that it was the UFC's reputation. You know, they were saying, I think Anthony Marnell was supposed to give like a rules review and he was like, well, you know, I didn't get through the whole document. Um, you know, I just got it late last night, but judging by who's submitting this, I trust their judgment. So right. stuff like that makes me a little uneasy about it. I understand both sides of it. I think from our perspective, we might, you know, not be covering it, but it's also because I'm not sure we, there's so much stuff going on now that I don't know how much we can allocate to cover this on a weekly basis. Well, you, we used to have that discussion when I was still a part of the junkie, yeah. you know, when Dan Stupp was around, and um, which, by the way, Dan Stupp did a great interview with Severe MMA and E. Spencer Kite, man. I listened to that this morning. It was great to hear him kind of going down memory lane, so check that out if you can, man. He kind of talks about the, the early days. Of, but I remember he and I would have those conversations, because it, it and it was really just kind of boils down to, like, bandwidth, right? Like, you know, we – I mean, do we cover the IBJJF finals? You know what I mean? Like, it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu at the highest level, and, it, and that's a huge part of mixed martial arts. And, and we're like, well, we just can't. Like, there's just so much going on. So completely understand from that perspective. I don't know what the depth of our coverage would be. I mean, as, as a consumer, I'm going to watch it. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I find that we, we, we went to the test event, and yeah. I was – I'm not going to lie. I was – I was highly entertained. It was super entertaining. I mean, it was great watching them with beers and the other stuff. I mean, <laughs> that might I mean, help. it's fun. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the alcohol definitely uh, made it much more pleasurable, I think, than just watching. But, I mean, there were definitely questions. But, yeah, I mean, kind of to, like, what Nolan said, I mean, like, the whole issue of what Dana was calling defense, there is no defense in the sport. In fact, you're penalized if you try to move your head, if you try to do anything. So you have to just take a punch or a slap, right. sorry. Uh, so that's like their form of defense. So I can see where some people get upset a little bit about that. And even there was one thing that I was thinking about it, and we were talking about it today in that lack of a defense, a little sort of loophole that we're wondering if they're going to change it. I remember one thing that we saw when we watched the, the preview show, the person slapping made a foul while he was going into the process of slapping, literally slapped the shit out of the opponent, was uh, foul, sir, whatever. I mean, gave him a foul. And then he got to slap him again. So he hurt his opponent. He fouled the opponent and then got to get an extra slap in with no now, sort of punishment. Now, are we sure that punishment. was an offensive foul and not it was a an defensive offensive foul? foul. It, well, it was an, it was an offensive okay, foul. Okay, that doesn't make any sense then. I, yeah. I don't remember that part of it, but if that's the case, you're right. That makes no damn sense. Because then to me, so we'll if just I hit do you wrong, I just get to hit you again? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, so, I mean <laughs> so there was definitely some things yeah. where you feel like, okay, now that's just undo pain that you're putting on this thing but i mean it all goes back to same thing with mma with fighting anything these are two p willing people that want to make money going in there having something that they consider fun who are we to stop them you know it's easy for us on the outside to say oh man you're two fucking crazy rednecks just want to slap each other's face like that's crazy but that's cool that's what they want to do so i'm like you're right. I mean, I could sit here and, and kick somebody and you think that's cool, but if, if I want to slap somebody and that person wants to take a slap, now you're, like, judging me? I can see where people it's are like, bizarre. it's a little bizarre um, in that sense. But, you know, I, 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 would, I would be lying if I didn't say some of the characters that went out there, I was immediately intrigued by uh, yeah. just some of their story. I mean, but I'm I'm the first person to go out and say I, I have a huge like white trash fetish like <laughs> and there's Whoa. something about this sport that just screams my inner nature. Uh, but that being said, uh, I could see where some people might just be like, okay, if I had to draw a line somewhere, this is where I'm going to draw a line and say, okay, that's too much. And yeah. I, we're letting these people 
do crazy harm. You're not even letting them defend against themselves where I can see where somebody's like, well, there's always going to be these flashy knockouts. And yes, this guy took a kick to the head, but he could have moved his head. He could have blocked it, but he didn't. And that's where the skill shows up. Where in this one, it's just purely how tough are you to take that slap, you know? And, but you know, it, it, it is still fun. And I mean, it's, it's like the perfect sport to watch drinking because I mean, like you feel kind of bad watching. I think I would feel bad watching if I wasn't drinking. Cause then I just feel like <laughs> there's gotta be something better on TV than watching two well, people slap the shit it. out of. Yeah. And then after you have a few drinks, you're like, I don't care. I don't I don't want to watch anything else besides this. Um, but you know, I, it's the UFC's, you know, I feel bad. And we've said this before, you know, the UFC staff's being asked to help build this thing. It's a different product. It's a different sort of company that's being owned by Dana and these guys, but the UFC is having to do it. So the UFC is kind of smart in the sense where they're piggybacking off of their UFC event, where there's a media presence already there. And then they're like, Hey guys, come do this, come put these stories together, push this out. And then we're going to have this little sort of Shows are going to start going, and then it's going to start building up, and then help us build these names, and then we're going to start the show Yeah. after you guys help us build something. So, I mean, it's smart on the UFC trying to piggyback and have uh, like-minded, combat-minded uh, folks lean into it a little bit to sort of help spread the word and kind of put it through our filter to kind of spread it to the like-minded folks. Because I think if they just try to slap it on TV without it sort of filtering through this, I think people would just be shocked, like, what is this? I'm going to be interested to see you what know? the TV ratings are for it, right? So, I mean, as we've, I think we've all said, it, you know, this is a TikTok generate, like, this is a viral moment. Yeah. We talked, you know, the, the clips that came out of Russia. I remember I wrote, uh, when I was still working for Junkie, like a blue corner on one of the old ones where it was like this 20-minute promo of, like, yeah. you know, the, 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 the down south, you know, this is earthquake or what, I don't know. But, you know, yeah. I was just like, why can I not stop watching this? But I, could, but I couldn't stop watching yeah. it, you know? But I do wonder, like, in it. I mean, it's, to me, it's very much like those viral clips on a phone, on a whatever. Yeah. I wonder how it's going to do as a TV program and if it'll succeed or not. It's funny you, you when you said that. It completely reminded me of something I wanted to say. Like, if people think this is shocking and they and they see this and it's two people standing and like, I think the setup that they're going to have, it's going to look beautiful on TV. I mean, it's oh, going to yeah. be well shot. It's going to be well lit. It's going to look good. But what do you think when you summon upon these videos of some of the shit coming out of Russians on these places? Two guys fighting in a literal phone booth. Yeah. Now you got two guys fighting in a car. Right. You know, where they're strapped in with their belts. They have to undo their belts and then they're doing jujitsu and fighting in a car. Like yeah. that seems more shocking to me than this shit. There was a you know there was slapping. A, like that just seems absolutely crazy. The fight circus organization that does like crazy stuff. What, I mean they like their whole thing is just yeah. like craziness. And I'll be honest, I watch that and I'm entertained yeah. by that stuff too. Um, like they had a guy and a girl fighting not too long ago, and I saw some of the same people that are like saying that they can't deal with slap fighting. Going, check this out. There's yeah. a guy fighting a girl. I'm like, where's the outrage? If you're outraged at that, yeah. how are you not outraged at, at a male female happening right now? Like you can't, you can't do yeah. both. I saw like a backyard <laughs> boxing or something clip. I think it was on TikTok or social media, and like a lot of people generally were like, oh, she really got it, and blah blah blah. And I was like. What is going on? I was like, maybe it is the filter when they see it. Like you said, the TikTok generation or the whatever. Like people see it in this little social media and they're like, oh, okay, it's just viral shit. Like, of course, it's going to be crazy, whatever. It's about spectacle or whatever. Maybe there's something different when they see it in the bigger lights, the bigger on TV, in a well thought out, well lit arena. Maybe then they're like, okay, we. Now I now I can't just see it as this like crazy social media shit because I would think if somebody saw a woman fighting a man they'd be like completely outraged like okay this is crossing a line you know but what was crazy when I watched this backyard thing and it was like an out of shape dude fighting a big old girl but like he was whomping on her and knocking down and then a bunch of people are like cheering it on in the comments and a bunch of people there. I think your white there. trash fetish came out again. <laughs> I know, a big old girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want, she was she was a very she was she was a big girl, but not like she wasn't like like fat and overweight. She was literally a big. She could have played probably linebacker and like it's something. She's a big old girl, uh, but I was like, people aren't outraged by that. Like just because it's on TikTok. Like if this was on regular TV, I think people would be losing their minds, you know, seeing this clip. But something about being in a social media on your phone. People just expect to see crazy outlandish shit on their phone, but maybe it's the the taking it from the phone world and putting it on regular TV, and then everybody's like, "Oh wait, no, 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 no! I have to judge it differently because now it's on my TV." Mm, you know, and I will say too something I've noticed since I've kind of 
brought this up in my non MMA life to my non MMA friends is I think in terms of recognition of what this is, a lot of people know what this is. Like they've seen the clips. Like, right. Yeah. I'll ex- I don't even have to explain to them what it is. I say slap fighting, which I know I think is the wrong term according to the glossary we got or whatever. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I'll explain it. I'll be, oh yeah, I've seen those. You know, I've seen that. I saw Logan Paul do it. I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger involved with it. Whatever, all that stuff. So it seems like the recognition, you know, is there. Whereas when MMA came in, it was maybe a bit more far, and people hadn't heard of that. Yeah. Now with the social media, at least everyone's had that scroll past their feed. So yeah, who knows? You know, it's it's interesting. Well, did you really for, like the belt? What's that? Did you like the belt? Uh, I, but you know what? I didn't. I mean, I, I didn't have a feeling one way or the other. Yeah. To be honest, I looked at. it, I was like, okay. I was like, there's that old font. There's that font that they love to use on shit. And I was just like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it looked okay. It I, I didn't. I, I will say when I saw the belt, I wasn't like, oh damn, that's that's yeah. sick. But I also wasn't like, ooh. Yeah. yeah I mean, it definitely did, you know? it, it definitely like, didn't look like they slapped the some cardboard <laughs> yeah. together and like they didn't sharpie over it or something like it's a legit belt. But I was like, I don't know what I think. I was like. I don't know. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do with the interviews today. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to put out, like, full interviews. These, But I, I did ask a lot about that. And there was one guy. The one, the one thing that we did see is most of them um, there today, or at least it seemed like almost all of them, had at least some MMA experience, some boxing experience, some combat sports yeah. experience. They'd already done it. And there was one gentleman, and, and I apologize. I'm sure I'll get to know their names once this stuff airs or whatever. But, um, you know, he he had had uh, boxing and, and MMA. And he was like, look, man. And because I, I asked everybody, what do you mean? Listen, people are worried about your guys' safety. What do you think? And he's like, man, think about like an amateur boxer. You know, how many punches to the head, repetitive punches to the head they take. He was like, think about American football, how many blows they take to the head. He's like, we're taking three slaps, you know, at most. So I, I don't know. I mean, I guess if they're involved, certainly they're going to be slanted to say, like, this is okay. But I, I don't know. It's just like that argument does kind of resonate with me that, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it was interesting to me, like, getting to just see the backgrounds of these people, like, the guy, you know, I think the guy I talked to was Carice uh, Archer, or Reese Archer, who was the, for people that don't know, the guy that Nate Diaz jumped at in a viral video and the guy spilled his beer. He claims he wasn't scared. He was just protecting himself, but that's semantics. Um, I was I was very interested. Like, I was like, you know, how many times have you done this or what was the try? He's like, I've never, I've never thrown a slap. I've never received one. Like, whenever I step on the show, it's going to be the first time I ever do it. So it's very interesting to see that some of these guys literally have never done this before. And I'm also a little bit surprised maybe that – and we don't know the full rosters yet, I don't think. I don't think so either. Um, it be interesting to see if there's anybody we – names we know from UFC's past or MMA's past. You know, these guys – some of these guys do have boxing MMA experience, but there's nobody that's been like that name where you're like, oh, I know them from. Yeah. I saw – The, I, the, what, the, the Testament guys, had Tony Lopez. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. When I saw him, I was like, all right, maybe I could feel a little bit better yeah. about this. I love that guy. <laughs> that you know, dude's been anybody, around forever, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. That dude's been around forever. So, all right, we'll see. Well, so, for anybody that uh, isn't aware or wants an update, uh, they had already taped some of the show previously. They were taping again today. In fact, uh, if the if this series of tapings has some poor audio, you can blame Darren Till for that because uh, we had quite the scene in the media room. They were they were running through the media room looking for wireless transmitters because it was jacking up their audio in the apex because they were recording while we were uh, while we were doing a media day, and it turns out that. Darren Till was actually wearing a, uh, a wireless microphone. I don't know how they couldn't figure that out sooner. Like, they obviously uh, – because when Tim O'Toole finally came back and they figured – he went straight to him. I was like, somebody had to be like, why do we keep hearing Darren Till's voice and then figured out, like, oh, it's Darren. <laughs> like, how do you not recognize Darren's voice? Like, they had to have been just hearing him walking all the way around, like, the venue or something. I don't know. It was kind of crazy. I just thought that was surprising that they didn't figure that out sooner, hearing his accent, like – Hmm, I wonder where this voice is coming from. But yeah, it's just funny that they went all the way through the media room and then it got so bad that they had to interrupt, had to interrupt the media day. <laughs> While he's doing his interview, they couldn't have waited just a little bit longer to, to do it or whatever. Some audio silly. techs trying to blame it on the media. It's not yeah. us. I was like, no. It's no, old it's not us. It was your own internal people. All right. Well, UFC 282 is this week. Uh, Jan Blachowicz, Magomed, and Goliath in the main event. The replacement main event. Uh, you know, both guys today kind of came in saying, look, didn't really – change anything you know what I mean it was all right which true I mean they were already preparing for the same opponents you know had to go to five rounds of course um it was already going to be a very important fight you know basically a number one contender fight um I did ask both of them you know hey are you going to feel like the rightful champion I mean Yuri relinquished slash was stripped slash whatever happened there you know the title you know you're going to worry about any asterisks or any perceived like hey you're not the legitimate champion and both of them kind of said oh, I, you know I thought they both had their right attitude they're like no and they're like I'll fight whoever they want me to, you know what I mean? And and I, I even that Jan, you know, Jan's not a trash talker, but I felt like he got as close to trash talking. Like, hey, don't forget, 
I wanted to fight him. <laughs> like, Yuri didn't want to fight me. Just said, I'll fight Yuri as soon as we can. So, I don't know. It's, it's weird because I, the, I guess probably the one thing I, I don't quite understand is why they just didn't do an interim belt. I feel like there's so many times where they do interim belts where we go, what is this here for? And, like, this seems like the perfect time to do an interim belt. So it's a little bit bizarre. Um, and I do, you know, I know people now want to talk about, well, it, how does this impact the pay-per-view? I don't know that I don't know that it'll have that much impact one way or the other, if not. So I don't know. Nolan, talk to me. What do you think about this whole situation? Because it's a wild one, right? I mean, we, a guy suddenly is hurt and gone and – and I can't blame Glover for not, you know, for not saying I want to step in there. It's especially at his point in his career. He knows he's only got so many chances left. Don't feel bad doing it on your terms. So, I don't know, this whole situation, how has it made you yeah, feel? Yeah, it was a lot to unpack at once. Like, usually we get these things kind of in steps. Like, you hear, okay, Yuri's hurt. And then you hear, all right, well, now, so, you know, maybe they took, they stripped him and this is going to be the title fight. But it was interesting to kind of get it all at once yeah. and have to process it. And then the Glover part of it behind the scenes, you know, everybody's like, what happened to him? Where did he go? Um, so to, to kind of, you know, to take a step back and process it a bit. Um, I think that honestly, the UFC kind of had their hands tied a bit when it came to this card, right? Like they needed to have a title fight. They needed to, they only had so many moving, you know, so many pieces that were willing to fight on that card. And um, let's face it. I mean, UFC 282 is a great event. I think there's a lot of interesting fights for different reasons, but I think it, it was maybe not one of those ones where you could, uh, you know, kind of scrap it and see what, you know, bump up another title fight or, or try to make do with, uh, option C, you know, there just wasn't a lot of pieces that you could play with. So, you know, it's unfortunate. I think in a perfect world, the contender, you know, I took some heat for saying this on Twitter from, uh, from a number of different people. I think Ali Abdelaziz was one of them, but he, uh, you know, it came across as me kind of talking poorly about Ankalaev, which is not what I was trying to do. What I was trying to say was, I feel like I would like to see in certain scenarios the, the person that is not the one at fault here, which would be Glover in the title fight, kind of get a little bit more of leeway with the UFC. You know what I mean? Like, all right, man, like, this sucks for you. Like, you know, here's – we'll give you an extra month or something. But obviously when you don't have a card that's dripping with overflowed title fights and everything else, you can't really do that. Right. So I think given the scenario, hopefully my, – my biggest hope coming out of this is that Glover is not on bad terms with the UFC. I hope they don't hold this over him going forward. Like, you know, if Yuri's going to be out a year – Give the title shot to Glover, get the winner, you know, of, yep. of this fight. But I think it's a great fight. I think it's Ankalaev in a world that was, if it was run by merit, I think the guys earned a shot. You know what I 100%. mean? Um, he's scary. He's got the perfect frame. He's a well-rounded fighter. Uh, you know, so I think uh, him and him and Blakovich, him and Blakovich is a great fight. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Are, are, I mean, uh, are, are we leaning ankle? I, I mean, I'll just I'll put it yeah. up. I'm leaning ankle live. Well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everybody's yeah. going ankle live. Three Pete. Yeah. yeah. I mean. No offense to Jan, I just Uncle Ives this dude that I think we've been watching and waiting for him to get his moment. You know, we've seen him just slowly kind of come up the ranks and stuff. But there were bits, you know, there were stuff that uh, somebody said today and somebody brought up to Uncle Ives, like, you know, about how, I don't know how they phrased it. If it wasn't like he was the most technical of fighters or maybe he had to worry about his strength, that he just sort of gets through these fights. You know, he, he doesn't have these big, crazy battles and you know i remember one day when i was there filming for eagle fc i was watching uncle i have uh throw down with some of these other guys and i remember thinking like man i'm not really seeing like as much as i thought i would see so i remember thinking like oh just don't think too much about it don't think about it too much you know there's there's i'm sure there's something else because everything that we hear from any training partner that trains with this guy is that he's a beast right. and that he's the dude that's going to be it. So, you know, I just thought it was interesting that maybe we haven't seen the lead up, you know, these big, crazy smashing knockouts every time he gets in there. But there is just something about him. He's just – if there's something that has the momentum going forward, um, it's got to be this guy. I mean, especially having us watch Jan lose the belt before and now it's kind of unceremoniously getting this opportunity again. It just doesn't feel like – and somebody kind of actually brought that up too, like – You've never taken the belt from somebody you fought for, but right. it's always been like a vacant belt, you know. Um, I just, you know, again, we can't discredit the the Polish power. The Polish power is always going to be there, but I don't know. Maybe it's just that here we are wanting to jump on the the new guy. We want to we want to see the fresh blood, but I just feel like everything about this kid coming in. I mean, like he has everything to do it, and I feel like we haven't seen his best yet. Dude, what, Which and, is crazy. And yeah. you know what's, what, what is so wild, too? And, and it's funny because, you know, it was in his UFC debut. But he's 
one Paul Craig second away miracle from being 19 and 0. You know That's what I crazy. mean? Like it was his first UFC fight. Obviously, he looked like a monster. He was undefeated coming in. It, in all honesty, he was just beating the piss out of Paul Craig. You know, and then obviously the the miraculous come from behind. Yeah. Situation. But it's amazing that. Uh, yeah, he's that one thing away yeah. from being undefeated. Yeah, it is crazy. I mean, that's just so MMA. I mean, it's the <laughs> the good yeah. thing is though. I think like his with the way that that played out, like his aura isn't necessarily spoiled. Like it's not like he went out there. We didn't see him get knocked out. We saw right. him on the ground get caught by a guy that's really good at it. And I saw on Twitter too. Um, have you seen that the humanizing sure, athletes of thing? Course, of course. Alex Buchanan. His was so like. Uh, Ankalaev's was was so what you would expect it to be. If you look at it, some of the stuff is just intimidating. Favorite food, lamb meat. Favorite <laughs> drink, homemade juice. Favorite color, black. Favorite movie, blood and bone. Like, just keep going down. Favorite animal, horse. Favorite hobby, riding my horse. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, dude is a fucking killer, man. Like, He's funny. He lives the lifestyle. On a bad day, oh. eating my horse. Yeah. It's funny. You know, we were talking about, because, you know, obviously like, a, lot, a lot of these Russians are very stoic. And, you know, he's not a big trash talker. He doesn't yeah. get super mobile. But he is, it, like, I wish I could understand him in his native tongue. Because yes. he, he kind of smiles and makes these facial expressions and stuff. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, I, I don't know. I wish I could just like, what converse are we missing? with him. Yeah, what are we missing? He's, he seems like he's got a little personality to him that maybe some of these others are just so stoic up front and so reserved. You know, he seems like... There's more to him there. Yeah, I agree. And was this uh, was this translator kind of new? Was this the guy? You no, he's been around. He's okay. been around. But he is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, he gives a little bit more emotion in the answers, which I like. You know. Yeah, he was much more. Yeah. It was. It's not like where. Yeah, uh, was it Fabiano? Will sort of emulate the uh, the same energy. He seemed much more into it than Uncle Iev did. Sergey, yes. Sergey, so I think <laughs> yes. the first time Sergey. I, I remember hearing him work was in Dallas um, early this year, and I literally made it a point to go to PR, and I'm like, I don't know who that dude is. I was like, but can we use him for every Russian? Because, like, that's yeah. the best Russian we've ever – because I always appreciate that the teammates or something will, like, try, yeah, yeah. but you're like, dude, right. come on. Like, I have no yeah. – now I can't even write a story because I don't even know what this dude said. And yeah. Ser Sergey is phenomenal. They, they tried to use him for all the Russians. Yeah, so he's great. really good. He's awesome. Uh, I will say this. I, I, think, I don't remember if I mentioned this on an and a half episode or, or when it was, but – I am hoping that if there's one silver lining, we keep hearing that maybe there'll be a second Madison Square Garden card this year instead of one. And you've got to think if, if the one is still going to be in November, the other one would be like April or May. And, you know, then maybe Glover could, you know, fight in, yeah. in, in Madison Square Garden. Nice send off. For, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's what he wanted. So it would all kind of come full circle. That would make me feel really good about this situation not being just total – crap for Glover yeah, Teixeira. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that, I mean, the MSG card doing it twice a year, I think would be a great move. I don't obviously don't know all the business and logistics of that. But to me, I mean, that's it, it gives you the real big fight feels in the yeah. big arena. And but If there's a market outside of Vegas, obviously, that yeah. can handle it and that would bring people to it's, – it's New York, hands yeah. down. I mean, like, I can't think of any other market in the U.S. that could – equal it Completely on agree. the same footing as like a Vegas but yeah I mean it's it's a shit getting around that town I mean the last uh, one didn't feel so bad because we were all sort of like close to where the host hotel and then the venue was like right there but I thought the last, not easy to get around. I thought the last <laughs> UFC trip was great, man. I, yeah, high, yeah. I, I highly re recommend to guys if you ever think just show just, up, just, just show, show up on, on fight day, roll in, roll back out, man. It's 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 yeah, really the way to do fight week. Yeah, that yeah. media day. There were some there were some yeah, brutal the, the, days that the commission week. has to step in and stop the 18 fighter media day. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please talk about real health and safety <laughs> issues. Oh yeah, man, please. you guys' yeah. health and safety. All right, it's the uh, Patty Pimlet show as well. Obviously, he is doing very well over in Europe, bringing the uh, the mark in there. But man, the dude's popular. Popularity is off the charts. This fight with Jared Gordon, interesting, right? Because they're both like, I mean, they obviously they both share a passion for you know mental health, which is is cool to hear. And and it's kind of cool that both of them are really just like, hey man, I like this guy, I respect this guy. Like it's gonna be a good fight, but we're you know, it, you know, Patty to his point was a little bit more of like. I like this guy a lot. He's a good man. You know, I'd love to work with him. Like, oh, I don't think he's very good. You know what I mean? But I, yeah, like, yeah. You know, I like, but it wasn't trash talk. You yeah. know what I mean? I think it was just him. It was but genuine. What, what right. do you guys it feel? Yeah. Because I mean, I love. I think everybody loves when Patty turns it on and he talks trash. But I also like this side of Patty as well. You know, where there was just a little enough snippets where it's like, okay, I still see you, Patty. But I like the Patty that was very just genuinely. Uh, appreciative of his opponent like i, I like hearing mm -hmm. fighters talk well of their opponents i mean granted we have some fighters are like you know what was it i think that last fight that went with steven and holland some fighters were going on that i think cheeto was one of the guys who was like enough with the high fives like you know why does everybody have to be friends you know like some fighters just don't like that but i kind of like it when we do see genuine appreciation of the work that people are doing outside of like the fight game yep. it's one thing to appreciate you know yeah that's a guy who's a good fighter you know but i'm not going to go over there and you know praise him every day because I think you're a hell of a fighter but when somebody's doing something outside of him that's meaningful and 
let alone that happens to cross over to what you're doing, might as well praise them, yeah. you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, push your other man up, you know. So I thought that was really, really cool to see it. But it was good to still see, you know, Patty just kind of still have a little still bit of Patty in bit, there, yeah. just a little in there. And my goodness, he coming in, I was like, who's this guy? What happened to the fat guy we saw recently? <laughs> like how he's able to just balloon up and then get down train so much. Train alter, bro. He does oh train alter. Yeah, there, that's yeah. it. <laughs> his, his, his is a really advanced one because, uh, I mean, I, I saw a picture somewhere, and I wasn't sure if it was from this one or it was an old one where it was already showing like his six-pack. And I was like, how does – he do it because he gets so big man but when he came in i was like who is this kid because he still looks like a young kid man when he comes he in there and then yeah, you see him get in the weight. cage yeah and and then he just gets in there and does stuff but um i uh, but going back to like just his personality coming in today obviously we knew that patty's gonna be patty and um but i like because i think when patty comes in like this this is the patty that can carry over and just get more and more followers, more and more people, because they they see him when he's on, when he's turned on, and he's talking trash because he's always funny, he's always really quick witted. He goes out and puts hella great performances, but then he gets on the mic, says something completely one hundred percent meaningful and and heartfelt, and then you're oh, like, man. oh man, then you really like him. Then here it is, fight week. He could take every opportunity just to switch into the heel mode. And he's being like another good guy. And then you're like, oh, my goodness, how can you hate? Then now somebody else is going to be like, I like that guy now even more. You know, I mean, it, that's the stuff that um, those discussions that he has with Dana that he, they talk about having him headline a fight night. It's all these little things that show this guy. He's multifaceted and he has all these different shades of him that can reach and, and, and just bring so many different fans. And I mean, and. Good for him. I mean, the kid deserves it. And, uh, man, today was just another day of him, him showing that there's a reason why he's getting the fast push up. Oh, he's, uh, he's phenomenal know, on the there. mic. And I, well, I tell you what, I really did uh, – that embedded clip where the guy walks up to him and is like, man, like, I want to let you know you saved my life, dude. Like, I was, you know, suicidal and I heard your words. And I really – like, that's that's cra- that's powerful, man. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, that was uh That was pretty crazy stuff. But, uh, listen – I I favor Patty in this fight, but I don't think this is an easy test. For Not him easy at all. I, I think to me because and and I've said this and and I know that Patty says he feels that people you know, hate on him, and, and I'm not here, like, oh, he's, he's pure hype, he doesn't have skills, he does, I'm not necessarily sold on him yet, Is like, that's definitely future UFC champion right there, I mean, future UFC superstar, absolutely, yeah. the guy's got enthusiasm, he's already on his way, he's yeah. already there, man, yeah. he's got hordes of followers, I mean, yeah. the guy puts on exciting fights, he always has, he's got the capability of great performances, but I don't know about you guys, too. I feel like this is kind of a perfect little test for him, you know what I mean? I think we're going to I think we're going to learn some things on Saturday night about where he really does stand. Yeah, 100%. And I think fighting, you know, not having this be in the UK too like we're going to get to really focus on him as a fighter and not all the, you know, all the energy that's in the arena. It's going to be just him and Jared Gordon and I think Gordon obviously uh, poses a lot of stuff that we haven't seen Patty be tested with before. Um, you know, I felt like the the uh Vendramini and Vargas matchups were kind of a lateral you know, guy that mm-hmm. was struggling to be in the UFC and, you know, Patty f- struggled briefly and then finished them. Jordan Levitt was like a little bit of a step up, but still not that experienced. Now he's fighting a guy that has been in there with some good people. Yep. He's been in there with Charles Oliveira, you know, some some really good names. So uh, if no, you know, I don't think Jared Gordon's going to be somebody to get rattled. I think he's somebody that's uh, got a good fight IQ and he's going to he's going to pose some some tests for Patty, you know, and I think uh, we're going to learn a lot about him in this fight. And to be quite honest, like if he wins this and passes with flying colors, I think we can start talking about some more of those marquee matchups, throwing him in a main event, giving him a guy somewhere in the 10 to 15 range. And we'll see uh, we'll see where he takes it from there. And, and, and let's be real. When you look down this card, no offense to anybody else and no offense to the main event. When Patty walks into that arena, he's going to get the biggest pop of the 100%. night. 100%. 100 percent weigh-ins fight night the, i mean it's 100%. gonna it's gonna be unreal I, like yeah. i mean you look down this card and there's a lot of really good ones. i mean bryce mitchell obviously he's gonna get a big pop but i mean like when you look down this line i could pretty comfortably say that patty pimblet is gonna walk into and the crowd's just gonna blow up i mean like yep. no offense to Jan and magomed i mean like when patty says like this is the the they're the people's main event i mean like the people are gonna go much more crazy over the walk-in for this fight than they will for the main event which is crazy and the main event's for a title i agree it's, it's, it's a little unreal. unfortunate bo nickel <laughs> was not able to compete on this card you would have had patty Bo and uh, Raul Rosas like three of the the marquee guys at the ufc we're gonna be if, if all goes well yeah. and what or all goes according to probably the monetarily what the UFC would want happen. Those would be three guys that I think will be 
competing for titles at some point. Yes, 100%. Yeah. 100%. But, well, you know, since you since you brought up Raul Rosas Jr., yeah. I, I, I don't want to skip the rest of the card by answering yeah. a minute. But <laughs> what did you guys make of him today? Because, listen, here's another one that, that I, have, I have openly said. And, again, I'm not trying to hate on the young man at all. I'm just like, look, I'm a little worried about this dude at 18 years old fighting at the highest level. I know everybody around him says, trust me, the guy's good enough. I know he came yeah. in and put on a very exciting fight. Uh, you know, as as Jay Perrin said, look, it was a little bit of a sloppy fight. There were some sloppy moments in it for sure, but it was, you know, he showed heart. He showed spirit. Um, I, I'm intrigued, obviously, I, just like anybody. I think he's getting a lot of attention, again, because of the age. Um, but I will say today we got to see a little bit of the man's personality, right? Because yep. Jay came in first and, you know, it was brought up that, hey, your, your opponent says he wants to be USC champion by the time he's 20. And Jay was like, well – you know, I want to be Santa Which Claus. Which at the That's time was great. It, yeah. was, it was fantastic. Funny line. Yeah. Jay like, said off the, I mean, he set yeah. a great precedent. Like, yeah. I thought, like, as soon as he came in, I was like, wow, if the rest of the media day goes like this, this is going to be awesome. And listen, I mean, what, he came in firing. He came in firing. And, yep. and listen, what he said is true, right? He's yes, like, look, he's 100%. an 18-year-old kid that hasn't been tested yet. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying he's not good. I'm yeah. not saying that. I just wonder if he would say that if Jay understood how hard that Raul had to fight to get pizza. <laughs> I think he would understand the streets that this kid had to come up. That was another you great know? moment. He was like, how hard was it to, for you to be a student in high school and a, a fighter at the same time? I was like, well, we you know, the only good thing at lunch they had was pizza, and everybody yeah, ran, ran down to get, to get pizza. there. And I was yeah. like, I was like, is he trying to be funny? Because this is awesome. I was like, I'm literally dying. I was like, I don't know if he realizes how funny and how awesome this is. Yeah. Because it was just so out of nature. And it's funny because, like, we see the kid get in there, and when he fights, you don't see his age. I mean, you, when you look at him, there's moments where you still see, like, wow, this is a kid. Right. But when you see him fight and you see that. The, the adversity he was able to work through and just he never stops. He's always going into different moves, and you're just like, wow, there's so many years of experience when you watch him fight. You forget how much, how young he is. Right. Then he walks in there. He's nervous to grab the water. He's like, can I, can I drink this water? Oh, oh, wait, oh, I didn't even see these waters. And then his age starts to show, and then he goes in there and talking about how he had to struggle to get pizza at lunch <laughs> and then, like, all this other shit. And then you're like, Okay, we are looking you at are an eighteen-year-old, you know, and it's funny because when we we heard his age before, I didn't even think about the possibility that he was still in high school. Right. I assumed he was done with school, that he was still just young. And, and then he's saying that like he's doing homeschool now, and he hopes he graduates. So I'm be like, you're, was your mom gonna fail you or like? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> even if you do homeschool, you still have to pass like certain. Oh, uh, okay. You still gotta file it. Somewhere. Yeah, certain okay. tests that to 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 show that you're on the level or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's funny. And so that's why he was he was hoping that he can you know get enough of the training at home to be able to pass those things so that he could pa graduate or walk with his because uh, he classics. still has to like show proficiency proficiency not like me speaking <laughs> uh, he has to show proficiency to be able to uh, justify the the school board or whatever um, but there's just you see little things like that and you're like wow this kid is literally having his best life he's still dealing with all that awkward high school shit. You know, and well, the pieces, I'll never forget that now. That's like the best thing ever. Like, I remember when I was his age, you know, uh, like just all that little other stuff to think like he's got a burgeoning career where he's on the, the possibility of being a huge superstar. Yep. And he's still a, he's still in high school. Well, like, he, it's ridiculous. He brought the veteran level trash talk game. Oh, when the Santa Claus Lord. comment got yes. brought up. He was like, well, guess what? He'd probably be better off being a Santa Claus yeah. than he would have fired. He thought of that on the spot. <laughs> that is fire. Well, I don't know if you saw the clips coming into it or something, but that I think it was. But I mean, like, at the very beginning, I felt like some of it was prepared. Like, some of his opening stuff, like, I felt like he was working into it. Like, you, you could tell he had practiced, like, trying to prepare or like talk a little bit of something like oh well he'll you guys will see on this so and so night i was like okay it's a little rough but i can tell he's prepared but then when he got to that stuff i just felt like he just needed time to get the nerves over and yeah. then then we started seeing them come out and then by the time he got to like the santa claus and other shit i was like okay he's rolling now like he's he's legit going because i think if he would go back and think later on they probably say maybe don't say the pizza thing or something <laughs> but there was something so purely awesome and it like was. just Unique, it was juvenile, an and yeah. it was like kids. it was so awesome. I mean, it was just it was just wholesome in the sense yeah. where, in a day where most kids, if they were like that, I could see where they'd be like, just say, "I'm the I'm the greatest thing next to sliced bread." Here he is, just being honest and open about struggles that a high school has about the cafeteria food. I was like, how cool and strange and bizarre is this? But there was just something perfect about it that just made it uh, made just makes you want to to root for the kid. You know, where do you where do you stand on the on the range of 
I can't believe this 18 year olds in the UFC to that is a guaranteed future UFC champion. Where in yeah. between do you do yeah. you stand? To me, like most cases, I'm always on the big. I'm, an, I'm a big proponent of not rushing prospects and like take your time. Like I think there's been some guys that have had their career kind of spoiled. Like I think Sage Northcutt was rushed. Mm. I think there were other guys that just too much too soon. Like what's the rush? And I think more recently there's been a more educated stance from a lot of these fighters. Like when I, I remember when I first started interviewing prospects, they were all like, I could go in tomorrow and I could be in the top ten and I could fight these guys and fight best in the world. And now it's more like. Like, well, I don't want to rush it. Like, I have very calculated coaches in my corner that know, you know, what kind of fights I should be taking. And that's great. And I feel like with him, to be honest with you, even though he's this young, I think his skill – What's, I, I'm not really sure he's going to be tested on the regional scene, you know. True. The guy he beat, Mando uh, Gutierrez, yep. he was a pretty legitimate, you know, up-and-coming prospect. So probably somebody that he would have headlined on the regional scene sure. against. So I think with the right matchmaking and, and just kind of taking it step by step, I don't hate that he's in the UFC. I mean, granted, we'll have to see how he does against a guy like Jay Perrin, but um, – as somebody that would usually be against something like this in terms of rushing or whatever, I'm actually very okay with it, especially after some of the stuff we saw in that Contender Series fight. There was creative stuff going on, fake flying knees into takedowns. Yep. And he's got a great jiu-jitsu coach who was brought up uh, by one of the other media members, uh, Hector Vasquez, who's the jiu-jitsu coach for Brendan Moreno and a bunch of other people. I think he's going to be one of the guys running Moreno's camp now that he's not with James Krause. So uh, very high-level grappling background, and if they can sharpen up everything else – um, you know, he did make some mistakes in that contender series fight position, kind of gave up position to try to gain like a lot of risks that maybe won't pay off at the UFC level. I think if you can get him mentally and physically right. Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, the, the potential ceiling is very scary here. Dig it, man. Uh, listen, just some highlights for us of card. Obviously, Ilya Tapuria facing Bryce Mitchell. Uh, we didn't get to see Bryce Mitchell. His plane was canceled or delayed or something. But they, they just told us, Hey, unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to talk to him today, but we did talk to Ilya Tapuria, uh, Fired up as usual, uh, you know, and, and it was, you know, he said, look, I, and I liked it too because he, he wasn't dismissive of Bryce's skills, you know, he's like, no, he's talented, he's, there's a reason that he's undefeated and, and um, you know, but, you know, I, I just think I'm going to be able to stop him, I think I'm better. Uh, did have some choice words about Patty Pimblett as well and uh, yep. we'll see if that meeting happens down the line, but uh, I don't know, for you guys, I mean, this, you know, as, as, as okay, Kokoff, you hit the nail on the head. Patty Pimblett, that's the one that the, the, the crowd is going to be all into. But I feel like as far as, like, hardcore yes. MMA fans, like, this is the oh, hardcore yeah. MMA yeah. fans' main event, this is, right? This is the fight right here. And it's it's almost kind of uh, – I, I don't think it's a fight we get to see this sort of matchmaking often. I think the UFC – and just both sides involved, like, they – I think both Mitchell and Taporia kind of wanted to be able to take on a, a bigger name, and they had earned it, you know what I mean? But just the options out there did not add up. It seemed like maybe the, the upper tier of the division wasn't necessarily willing to, to uh, take that risk without some, some greater reward. But I think that speaks to both of how, how good these guys are, and I think that this is, like you said, you hit it on the head. This is the best fight, in my opinion, my favorite fight on the card. I agree. And both of these guys, maybe they don't have those marquee wins yet, but one of them is going to get one over the other. Yeah. What are we hoping for with uh, Darren Till? What do we expect? I mean, the guy. I gotta say, yeah. for today, it does seem like he's matured. I mean, yes. the guy seems like he's legit matured in in the way he was talking. Just listen to him. Physically, he seemed to look good, you know. But I, I guess, I mean, first of all, Drickus Duplicy is a tank. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and you just wonder, Darren Till, you know, is. You know, knowing knowing that we know he's taken fights with ho terrible injuries because he's not going to pull out. I mean, it, do we know if he's 100? I, I don't know. I, I feel like Till is one of these guys that that, that everybody cheers for because his personality and he had some great moments and he's funny on social media and all those things. But like, I don't know, man. I, I and, and again, not trying to doubt the guy, man. He says, look, I'm in shape. I've worked harder than ever. But I just, I just worry if this guy's ever at 100% again, you know? Yeah, and I mean, he kind of, I don't want to say told on himself because we don't know if he's hurt, but I thought it was interesting when he was talking about his eye poke. And he was saying, you I know, it was not, so bad. I not think about it. It was after so he said bad. That. And it was one of the worst eye pokes you could ever have. Yeah. But all I could think about was how I'm not going to pull out of another fight again. So, who's, I mean, there's the mentality right there. If he That's hurt it. himself, he's probably sitting up there hurt, you know? Right. He's, <sighs> not, he's not pulling out again. So, um, it, hope, you know, I'm hoping we see him healthy, you know? I yeah. think he's a, a good spirited guy. He's. Somebody that, again, had a lot of pressure. He had a title fight pretty early on in his career. Has had a very rough few years. But um, to me, man, I just I, – for all of our sakes and, and not to cheat anything, I would like to see him in there healthy. And yeah. If yeah. he loses, he loses. But And, that, and that's the that's tough it. one. Because yeah. Just like, be in there 100%. Because he's not fighting enough, and then you want to see him rest. You want to see him recover. But then he goes and gives this training, and then he takes one of these serious, crazy eye pokes in training. It's just like – 
bro can't, can't catch, catch a, break, a break, you know? <laughs> and I mean, like, you know, I, I, obviously I homered for, for Darren and that's why I'll always pick Darren for the rest of life, yes. you know? So I picked Darren, but honestly, um, if I wasn't homering for Darren, I would easily pick Duplessis in this fight. I mean, I was really surprised. Our staff picks, almost everybody picked Till, and I was really, really, really? surprised. Really surprised. Wow. Well, these are the ones that, that I remember mm. seeing. I even put a disclaimer next to mine and said, I'm, I'm, I'm homing for Darren, but my head says Drickus, like 100%. Uh, and, mine like, too. I don't – I was really, really surprised. I don't know if it's just because everybody loves Darren Till. Who did you pick? I picked Till. I'll tell you why. There's certain fighters that I just feel like I, I just like want to retire from picking their fights. Yeah, Drica, the Drikas is one of them. Can't, can't get because I right. watch yeah. watch him and it was. It's sometimes it's like a bar fight. Like his fight with Brad Tavares, he was getting yeah. wild. He was getting out of control, but he's winning. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know how to like mentally wrap my head and around. Partially, this. but part of you wonder if that's just Tavares. Tavares brags yeah. everybody into a bar fight. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like Drikas is just a he's a, he's a beast, man. Like the, he's shown me that. I mean, I don't. You know, until somebody really, I guess when I see that that name on the opposite side, that's the guy I'm going to pick. I mean, like, his just his last performance. But obviously this one is Darren. I was like, well, that's the guy. I obviously have to take Darren. But I, I think this is a tough match for Darren. And because, like you said, I don't know if he's 100%. And then he goes in there talking about how he has this eye thing. And there was just even something about him today. He looked in great shape. You know, he shows us his abs. But there was just something in his face that I – just something in his eyes. I'm like – I'm looking at him. I'm like – he didn't seem all there. Like I was wondering, I don't know if it was like cut. weight cut. That's why yeah. I was. I don't know if it was just weight cut. Pulled up and yeah, it was tied. like which is like he's still so trying to yeah. cut or something. Or something and, he was and that's why it. I was thinking like, yeah. man, he's struggling right there. But he made it through and he was carrying a smile and we still saw little bits. And part of it's him choking it, uh, chalking it up to being a more mature, which we you saw, you could see that in his words. I mean, he was just a much more mature. Sort of Darren, but this is also a Darren that's taken a lot of injuries since mm -hmm. when we first saw him, when he's taken some losses since we first saw him. Any of that sort of stuff would humble or possibly mature a person. But, um, I mean, how can you not love Darren? and love, You know what you're going to get with Darren, and this is the kind of cat that whether he's 75% or 60%, he's going to go out there and give you 100% of what he's capable of doing. But this is just one of those tough opponents going in there that, my Lord, you need to be 100% going in there into this fight, and I just don't know. But I was willing to uh, – I'm going to – I'm gonna. I signed Darren on the dotted line, and I would Absolutely. be happy taking that L 100% on that one. But I just feel like this is, is going to be a tough one to watch because – I would love to have Darren go out there and just be the Darren that we thought we were going to see from the, his very first fights on, that we thought that this guy has the, the future potential of being a champ. I'd love to see that Darren show up and just knock Drickus out. I just don't know if we're going to see it this mm -hmm. weekend. Fun card, man, all the way through. Santiago yeah. Ponsonibio, Alex Morono, which obviously we would have all liked to have seen Robbie Lawler in there. He is a legend. But Alex Morono, you know, is going to come make it a scrap. That should be a lot of fun. It's a tougher fight mm -hmm. than Robbie. I think I just Robbie's not the same Robbie. It's true. I mean, like, true. I, Alex, I mean, like, Alex, even on short notice, and I'm glad that they're doing this little, you know, catch weight thing. I think this is a tougher match for Santiago, honestly. Bold, bold statement there. Yeah. Uh, on prelims, Jarzinho Rosenstrike versus Chris Dawkins. A big one for both those guys. They need they need a positive result. Edmund Shabazi in his bat needing a positive result as well against a monster a in Dolce Lundi and Bula. <laughs> Chris Curtis, Joaquin Buckley could absolutely steal the show. I mean, they've been talking yeah. about trying to put on fight of the night. Billy Quarantillo versus Alexander Hernandez at featherweight. Anxious to see that yeah. dude at 45. I don't know how and just that. listen to all these fights, like on prelim. These easily could be a fight night main it's card. It's going to be banger. It's, easily. It's, it's gonna be banging hard. Let's get the uh, let's get the picks update. MMA Junkie staff picks, bro. Still up by nine. Nine. And that they, has to be like the widest margin of victory. It's funny. Erickson's like, I think we could pretty much already claim it. I was like, bro, don't, don't jinx don't me. Don't jinx me. Don't fucking jinx me. Don't don't y'all start saying that. What the greatest right? collapse in the history. Oh, I know, right? That was, You're going so 0 like, and 9 and somebody going 10 and 0. There's this one, and then there's what? Bell Tour 289 is Friday oh, night. Oh, true. 289. Yeah. And then there's so one other event. Left. Yeah, there's the last UFC fight night. Yeah. So so there's and then what, what about the – would you guys pick the New Year's Eve or no? Um, He's I like, nope. I think, <laughs> I, I, I think we had decided that we were considering that a Ryzen event. So, so I think it would be. Oh, uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I want to say we just have like this weekend and then one other one. So just yeah. got to wrap it up. But yeah, Let's see if somebody's gotta, down by uh, down by four. If you're up by four, then somebody will try to claim that. Then so oh, yeah. we got one more event left. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's funny. Like, yeah, for some reason, man, it really like I'm looking at the guy about the number two, and I'm like, okay, I got that nine. But like, then it starts dropping off. Like some people at the bottom of our list, I'm like, bro, how are you like that far behind? Like, there's yeah, some that are like, trash. he's not even humble. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
how do you suck this yeah. bad at picking? Well, look at – all right, I'm 204, <laughs> 204 and 109, okay? That's a respectable, that's, that's 204 and 109. Danny's 154 and 159. 50 picks away from me. Bro, I could talk <laughs> shit about that. Can I not talk shit about that? 50 picks behind. I could have took the last 10 events off, <laughs> and he couldn't catch up. <laughs> so, yeah, I talk a little Brutal. shit. All right. Talk a little Listen, shit. Nolan, since we got you here, it is Bell Tour 289 is this weekend as well. We won't do a full breakdown of that by any stretch, but uh, obviously you ended up being a de facto Bell Tour beat reporter for quite a while because of <laughs> the, the geographical Baron. location. <laughs> the Baron. What did we <laughs> call Baron. you first? We had the mayor. You were the mayor of Bell Tour or something? The mayor of Uncasville. The mayor of Uncasville. Yeah. And then I was I think <laughs> the I fight sphere. The yeah, the, the fight Bell sphere. Yeah, the mayor yeah. of the fight sphere. Uh, but talk to you about, I mean, obviously – uh, man, their bantamweight division is legitimate. I mean, I think all four of these guys that remain in the Grand Prix could absolutely compete in the USC's bantamweight division. I think they're they're all very talented. Uh, Rafael Stas, Danny Sabatello, Patchy Mix, oh, Matt Med, Mega Med, such a fun fight. But awesome, awesome Grand Prix fights there. Obviously, Danny Sabatello is probably the best known out of the four at this point because of his trash talking. And of course, we have got the rematch between Liz Carmouche and Juliana Velasquez as well. And then you've got you know you've always got the belt or prospects, the Dalton Roster, the Cody Law, Kyle Crutchmore. So I talk to you about your excitement level or what you expect out of this, you know, at least out of the, the Bantamweight Grand Prix. Yeah, I, I love their Grand Prix, and I know PFL is kind of obviously known for the tournament format now, but I, I kind of like that they coexist. You know, I think Bellator making it a special thing where it's just focused on one division, having all the, the marquee names that they have in that division fight in a bracket style is great. Doesn't really interfere. Or I don't think PFL or Bellator's tournament formats lose any shine with the other existing. With this one, though, in particular, Bantamweight across the board in MMA, I think, is the strongest really? division. I know we say that over and over again about the UFC, but it's true in Bellator, too. And for Danny Sabatello, Rafael Stotts, two guys that were kind of homebred Bellator talents to, to be able to promote a fight like this, I think for Bellator has to be a win. Um, they got to be happy with that. I feel like so many times it's somebody using somebody else's name recognition. You know, you got to clear A side, clear B side with this. They've done a great job talking. I think um, Sabatello has done a good job of doing something similar to Colby Covington without being Colby Covington, you know. Um, doing it kind of a, a little bit more of a professional way right. and less controversial. Right. And then Rafael Stotts has also served as like, he's not necessarily known as the trash talk guy, but he's very good, very quick in the, the rebuttal category. So I love this fight. And I think the patchy mix versus Magomed Magomedov is being really overshadowed. Yeah. That's it's, an excellent fight. It's not getting fight. any of the love because, yeah. because of all the talk, right? Yeah, these fights are, I mean, there's an interim championship on the line. But in terms of the tournament, these are these are equal, you know, weighted fights. So... I think both um, Magomedov and Mix would be like would do some damage in the UFC. I think they're both excellent. They're both probably at the prime of their careers right now, especially Mix, who looked great against Horiguchi. Yeah, oh, that's um, I mean, what a huge win that is for yeah, confidence wise. Yeah, as well, totally. You know, I, you know we, we've seen Horiguchi go down, get knocked out before, but I don't know if we've seen him totally, with the exception of Demetrius Johnson, get like just totally dominated like that. So um, both of those fights are good. And then for people that maybe aren't familiar with, with too many uh, of the Bellator prospects, I think Dalton Ross, Ross is at the point we can't even call him a prospect. I kind anymore. of agree. As soon as I, yeah. I said prospect, and yeah. I was like, I probably shouldn't have even said that. Yeah. So I'm glad no, you pointed that out. He's getting there, man. I think he's, you know, their middleweight division's not uh, the deepest, so we're not that far away, I think, from him having a title fight. And the other one I want to bring up uh, on the prelims, too, is Pat Downey. Pat Downey I think well. uh, that's somebody that could that could really turn some heads. I mean, people talk about Bo Nickel, and I know that Pat's not Bo Nickel's level, but he's somebody that was in there with Bo Nickel and had a lot of success, uh, you know, in the wrestling community, uh, despite his controversial uh, personality and some of the things he did. He was a very, 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 very good talent. So good on Bellator for bringing him over and, yep. and trying the experiment there. I, and, I, and I, you know, we've praised him for it Ooh, along the way, but I that love That was like listening to the State of the Union right there from the mayor of Bellator right there. <laughs> thank, if thank somebody you, knows Coker, Bellator, that is yeah. your guy right there. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, but you know what? I, I, I do love, and I think, you know, Bellator, obviously, they've been actively doing this for a while where they really they identify potential talents yep. and they say, we're going to bring them in at O and O. Like, I and know they, they have nobody. Wait, and, they build them up so well. Yeah, they build them up, man. And yeah. they, give them, they give them fights that, I mean, let's be honest, they give them fairly yep. winnable fights. But that's to me, that's okay. That's what you yep. do with prospects, yep. right? I mean, that's in every yep. other sport, that's what you do. It's just that, you know, at the USC level, obviously they don't have the luxury of doing that here with Bellator. They can because they can bring out, let's bring in a local guy. It doesn't have to necessarily be somebody that's on the roster, somebody that maybe we just have one. And and they're starting to see, and like you said, I mean, some of this homegrown talent in the tournament, some of that stuff's 
really starting to pay off, yeah. and that they've got. I mean, their roster is really good right now. Yeah, and you know, I think Bellator uh, kind of took a hit a little bit when two things: they cut back on events, and then also they moved away from trying to go after fighters based on name recognition. You know, like old UFC guys. I think almost now there's a there's kind of a mindset in the company we don't want those people. Right. Like you even saw it a little bit with Yoel when he first left the UFC. Coker was like, nah, 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 we don't want it. But then I think they realized maybe the reward was there. Like he's still so popular, we can bring him in, he can compete. So that was an exception. But overall, they really haven't been the guys to bring on former UFC fighters. And they've also implemented a more merit-based matchmaking system with their rankings and everything. But I think it, it does hurt them a little bit when you don't have the Chael Sonnens or whoever to get all these people to tune in to watch these guys. So for people out there that might have got tired with Bellator or whatever, I think that their fights now are way better, even though maybe there's not the Kimbo Slice buzz of a card. You yeah, know? I 100% agree. Yeah. And it is, it is weird. It's kind of a catch-22 there, yeah. right? Because on the one hand, you don't want to be known as just the UFC washout league. You know what I mean? Yeah, you but can't at the same win. Time. I mean, we, I, I was criticizing them at the time sometimes for, like, you know, having old man fights. And now here I don't have old man fights, and I'm saying, well, they need something to, you know, get, <laughs> Turn their Damn attention. It. So they need some of those old men fights. Yeah, they just man, they got. I, I just, they just need to get some more fights on CBS, man. Yes. Like they need to get that's some more. For them. They I think that's the biggest story Showtime, out of all man. that. Like Fedor's final fight's huge for them. You know, I think um, having Yoel fight Nemkov is very interesting. But I think the biggest storyline for me out of that is like, you know, MMA is going to be on CBS. Yeah, like that's that's a big win. I don't care what promotion you are. Like that's that's huge for them. I I completely agree. Yeah. I just again, I know that. Look, man, Showtime's paying them good money, and that's that's you know they need that team. But I really do feel like less people are seeing the product just because it's behind that premium paywall. You yeah, know, yeah. I, mean, I know ESPN Plus is a paywall event, but it they have so much content on there. Like you're you're, you're ridiculous if you don't have ESPN Plus. Yeah. Um, now, of course, you got one championship on Amazon Prime, which who doesn't have Amazon Prime? So it's, yes, it's behind the paywall, but is it really yeah. when it's something that you're definitely getting. But I just feel like that Showtime paywall, like I do have it. I mean, I obviously I have it for work. I don't know if 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 they weren't on there, if I'd have it, to be honest with you. Like, there's not – like, I used to watch Dexter back in the day, and there's, you know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, what was the the one with the Hitman dude? Uh, I don't can't even remember the name Barry? of Barry? No, oh, but Barry, I do like Barry, but that is that on Showtime? It's no, that's HBO, HBO. HBO Max. Uh, but anyway, um, I can't even remember. The, um, I know what you're talking you about. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. I used to watch, but there's not a lot of, I'll be honest, there's just not, I don't open that Showtime app for anything yeah. other than really when Bellator's on. And so for a lot of that, for you know, I can write off my, my Showtime purchase because it's a work expense, you know what I mean? But for people that can't, that have to pay, and I think it's like 15 bucks a month. Mm. I think that hurts them, man. Yeah, there's a lot of different things, and I, I think part of the issue, like behind the scenes, is the fact that you know you got Bellator, but then you also have Showtime and Showtime Boxing, and they you know can't schedule them on the same weekends, and they're trying to limit the amount of events. So I think uh, it's not all Bellator's fault. Part of it's you know the parent company and the way that it operates, but uh, yeah, there's certainly some things I think they could sharpen up. I think having less events again too is a catch-22. Like the events are all better; they're all rostered fighters from top to bottom, but when you go six weeks sometimes without an event, people kind of forget about you a little right. bit, to be honest. So um, hopefully they're they're going to work some of this stuff out. I think, uh, you know, there's been – I feel like the other thing is, too, they need, like, for a while there, they would always catch your attention again by getting a big signing. Yeah, yeah. Like, out of left field, too, a lot. Right, right. Oh, shit, Rory McDonald, we didn't even know, you know, or yep. – fucking uh, Corey Anderson was the other one. Right. We went to bed one night thinking he was on the UFC roster and like number three in the rankings. Yep. And then the next morning we wake up and he's signed with Bellator. So I think they, they could use some of that shock signing factor that PFL I think has capitalized very well on recently. Agree. Um, so I guess we'll see what 2023 has in store. I, it does. Feel, by the way, Ray Donovan, for anybody yes. that's yelling at me yes. going, you idiot, it's Ray Donovan. Okay, I right. And Ray when Donovan. I said – that I knew what show you're talking about. That is that exactly, was the show yes. that we were talking I wasn't about. Just, I wasn't bullshitting trying to get you out of it. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, all right, but listen, uh, busy weekend. I know that you've got to go. There's some ramen to be consumed, yes. and then you got to jump on a plane mm-hmm. because you're a jet setter like that and head on back to <laughs> Phoenix. But uh, glad you could make it to Las Vegas. Anytime. Certainly, man, appreciate you doing this and, and hanging out with us for a day. And obviously for anybody that liked what you're listening, we certainly would appreciate you taking a minute to rate, review us, leave us some feedback. Uh, if you really want to take the game to the next level, we definitely appreciate you going to patreon.com slash the MMA Roadshow and supporting the show for a little S three dollars a month you get the exclusive access to the and a half episodes which is pretty much every week uh, let's be honest because it's <laughs> UFC like every week uh, and yeah but more than anything we just appreciate spending your time with us so thanks for listening